Um, this seminar series is brought to you by the University of San Francisco's Masters in Data Science program and that's sponsored by USF's Data Institute. Uh, today, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Luis Serrano, who will be author of Rocket Machine Learning. Uh, his talk today is titled, What is Quantum Machine Learning and How Can it We Use It? Um, Luis is happy to answer questions during the presentation. Uh, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I will let him know. And I'll pass you the microphone. We're also going to leave time at the end of the talk for questions as well. So welcome, Louise. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation. So yeah, yes, yeah, mentioned, uh, I'd like to, um, I like to make this more of a dialogue than a, than a monologue. So if you would like to, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I have the chat right in front of me and I also can see all your faces. So feel free to either put it on the chat or, or talk or raise your hand on the Zoom, or um, I guess you have the system in the room that if there's a question, you can ask it there, right? So yeah, as I said, feel free to stop me. So today, today I will tell talk to you about- Recording in progress. You good there? I will talk to you about demystifying quantum machine learning. So I'll tell you about First of all, a bit about how quantum computers work and then how, quant how we do machine learning with them. It's actually very similar to the normal machine learning, just instead of the operations are slightly different and the, the, um, the numbers are slightly different, et cetera, but it's, it's, it's very similar style. So if you have heard, basically quantum is now sort of getting into into most uh, industries. Uh, so in the same way that all roads lead to Rome, all, all industries need lead to quantum, and every every uh, time we find more and more applications in in places, all all kinds of of applications of quantum computer. Basically, whenever there's a classical computer can do something, and there's a bottleneck or something, a quantum computer can can fit in. So this is where I work, Zapata Computing, and it basically is a um a, a platform for for using quantum computers. You can just uh, go and program in a quantum computer. Right now, there's only a few of them. But you can uh, through this platform called Orchestra, you can you can actually use. Uh, I think there's some feedback. I wonder if we can be. There you go. Thank you. Um, and um, for for businesses and researchers, you uh, groups of research, you can uh, you can use this platform to send workflows to a quantum computer. So. Um, yeah, I can tell you more at the end. So what I'll tell you today, I'll tell you a bit about the, the, the fundamentals of quantum computing in a sort of basic way. Then I'll tell you a, a bit about generative machine learning because the, the machine learning that we're going to be using is, uh, is, is generative models. And then I'll tell you about what quantum generative machine learning is. And um, we won't have time for this, but I do have a coding lab in PyPool that I can show you, I can share with you. And then at the end, I'll give you links about for a demo of, uh, of doing this in an actual quantum computer in, uh, in a, the platform that we have, which is called Orchestra. So first, uh, let me tell you what is uh, classical generative machine learning, right? So as we know, there's the machine learning that we always use, which is supervised machine learning. Uh, that's if you, the first course you take is always on supervised machine learning and it's just the, the one that's most, most popular. And the way I like to see it abstractly is you have some kind of model and some kind of data set. Uh, and in supervised machine learning, the data set is labeled. So you have every, let's say here, every data point is an, uh, is an image of an animal. And the label is what animal it is, a dog or a cat. And what it, the model learns is to, um, if you're given an image without a, or, or, a, or a set of features without a label, the model learns to say, based on the data set, it says, okay, I, I, I analyzed your data set and I think, I think what you gave me is a dog. So that's supervised machine learning. And in unsupervised machine learning, which is a little more complicated um, because there's just less things to work with, what you have is you don't have labels. You don't have, you don't have them, the names of your you know, dog or cat or something. What you have is just a bunch of, let's say, images, a bunch of and you don't know what they are. You, you don't, the computer doesn't know what they are. So because it doesn't know what they are, it can't really say this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a bird, this is a car. 
But what it does is it tries to find as much information as it can from the data set from what it's, from what it got, it tries to it tries to do the best with to work with what it with what it got, and so an example of, of unsupervised learning is, is is for example clustering. Well, it will say, well, I, I don't know what these things are, but they all look alike, and I don't know what these things are, but they all look alike, and etc. Um, so one branch, uh, uh, this is uh, there's many sort of branches on unsupervised machine learning, and one of them is generative machine learning, which is kind of the in some way, the backwards direction of, of supervised learning. And here, what, what, the, what the model does is uh, instead of learning to say, give it an image, tell me if it's a dog, it does the opposite. If you say, give me a, show me a dog, it actually draws one from scratch. So if you've seen uh, any of the images of uh, faces of people that are, that are fake, there's a, there's a page I think it's called um, whichfaceisreal.com. You should check it out. Uh, and it draws a, a face that's completely generated by a neural network and one that is uh, a real one. And it's very hard to tell which one is which one is which because these uh, models have been really, really advanced and they not, not only create images, but they create, um, you know, text or videos or music or anything like that, voice. So, um, so this is a type of, of it's not obvious, but this is a type of unsupervised machine learning because at the end, what unsupervised machine learning does is it it tries to understand the data as a whole, right? So it's, it's a lot more complicated and actually lately just a lot more useful than, than supervised machine learning because supervised machine learning only, only learns to answer questions like a yes, no question or, or a quantity. Whereas unsupervised machine learning actually, actually tries to capture the distribution of the data, right? It tries to learn where that data came from. It's a lot more, it's kind of like doing philosophy, right? It's like saying, let me try to understand this in a, in a higher way, as opposed to let me understand it enough to pass the quiz and ask, ask some questions. So it's just, it's just a lot more, a lot more complicated. And um, so, so that's, that's the one we picked. That's the one we're going to work on for many reasons. One of them is that it's, it's harder for classical computers to do, to do generative modeling. And so we're picking that one for for quantum computers, because it actually will make a difference if you if you can speed up the models. Um, if you speed up linear regression using a quantum computer, nobody will notice because linear regression and, or, or these classical methods are are very well developed on classical computers. So it's not like a quantum computer is going to be in common and 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 make it better marginally. Whereas a, a model that's hard, it's um it's much uh, you know much more room to to improve for for that and other reasons that I'll tell you. But let me tell you a bit about roughly what's the difference between classical and, and quantum machine learning. This is a very high level, but in a classical model, let's say we have a neural network and a neural network is just one thing that numbers come in and numbers come out, right? So numbers come in, funny things happen and numbers come out. And then you wanna tune in the what's on the pink dots to see if you get what you wanted. So you say, did I get what I wanted? And if the answer is no, you update the parameters you have in pink. And uh, what you're doing is you're, you're adding numbers, multiplying numbers using activation functions, et cetera. Well, a quantum machine learning model is, is the same thing, except instead of numbers, you have something called, called qubits, which I will tell you what they are in a little bit. And the qubits, you know, they go through the quantum network and they operate on each other. And then you get some numbers out. And then you check if the numbers are what you wanted in what your data tells you. And if they're not, then you update whatever parameters are on the yellow things. Uh, these these um, are not addition, multiplication, or activation functions, but they're more like things like rotation, things like entanglement, things like quantum gates. I will tell you all about this. And as I was mentioning before, why, why quantum for general models? Well, reason number one that I told you is that because it's harder. And reason number two is, is more, um, more intrinsic to what the difference is between a classical computer and a, and a quantum computer. Um, a classical computer is very much an input output machine, right? You, you put some input, you do a function, and then an output comes out. And then you sort of teach it what function you needed to, what parameters you needed for, the, for your function. Uh, quantum computers are, are, are different. They're not so much input output machines. They're more like a random number generator, right? Uh, you don't need an input. You can just observe. And, and, you, and you get different things every time. So for example, my, my favorite uh, simple uh, 
example of quantum supremacy, which is uh, kind of simple. It's, 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 it's a coin toss, right? A classical computer cannot toss a coin. A classical computer cannot generate a random number because they're deterministic. Everything in a classical computer is deterministic. You cannot generate a random number. You can generate a, a, a number that's you complicated enough to look random. So it's pseudo random numbers, but you cannot generate a random number. If you run the classical computer in the exact same conditions twice, you will get the same number. Whereas a quantum computer can actually so it's a generating, it's a random number generating machine. If you can, you can run the exact same algorithm, the exact same program on a quantum computer in the exact same conditions and you get different things. And so, and so for unsupervised learning where you don't have an input, you just have outputs, then quantum computers are, are much better. And so that you can, you can do both on both, right? You can do supervised and unsupervised on a classical computer and also supervised and unsupervised on a quantum computer, but they lend themselves better for unsupervised learning or, or anything where you don't need an input. Um, so yeah, so for example, in, in, if you wanna get, if you want a, a classical computer to generate faces, you can't just generate them out of the blue. You need to put in, you need to fake an input and then an output comes out. But then faking that input is not easy because as I said, classical computers are not good for generating random numbers. Uh, whereas in the quantum one, it's, it's, uh, it's much easier. So that's another reason why we're going for- No me contigo porque pasó esto, yes. Question? Okay. okay. Um, so there are a bunch of classical generative models, for example, generative adversarial networks, which is, are the ones that you may have seen, the ones that draw these perfect looking faces. Uh, there's also restricted both machines, variational encoders, et cetera. On the quantum side, there's um, basically a quantum uh, analog of anything. There's something called quantum generative adversarial networks, something called quantum Boson machines, and something called quantum circuit born machines. And those are the ones that I will tell you today. So I will tell you about one particular quantum generative machine learning model called the quantum circuit born machine. For now, for that, we need to talk about the quantum, right? So what is quantum computing? I'm gonna tell you a, um, a sort of simple picture of, of quantum computer. And a quantum computer, everything is made of qubits in the same, same way as in a classical computer, everything is made of bits. So what is a qubit? Uh, how is it different from a bit? This is how I like to see bits. I like to see them as a switch, right? Like a switch of on and off. So you can be on. And so for the duration of this talk, um, zero is up and it's red and it's uh, on. And one is uh, down and blue and off. So whenever I have blue, think of this. Whenever I have red, think of this or, or zeros or ones. I'm going to kind of go all over the place, but this is sort of the, the consistent notation. So when you have a classical switch, you can be an on or off. You can be on zero or one, and that's it. And so a computer is just a bunch of switches and they operate with each other and you can solve problems and do calculations by flipping these switches all over the place and, and having gates and things like that. Well, a quantum bit or a qubit is more like a slider. You know, if you have these dimmer switches that you can put in on or off or like in romantic in the middle and you know that kind of stuff you can go anywhere you want and that's a qubit so you can have the the zero state pointing up and notice that i've used a notation with like a funny brack and uh, this is called the um i think it's the ket or the bra it splits the bra, bra the bracket into bra and ket and i think i think this is the ket but anyway i'm not gonna need that um, you have the, the zero position and the, and the one position, but you can also have it, everything in between. So you can have like a superposition or of on or off, like you can have in the middle, but I can also have it like, you know, three quarters from the top. I have three quarters of zero and one quarter of one or one quarter of zero and three quarters of one. I can have any combination that I want. So basically for any one of these, any point in between zero and one, there is a qubit that is this much percentage zero, this much percentage one. Actually, there's more than that. It's not just uh, it's not just a line that goes from the bottom to the top, right? Between zero and one, it's not just an interval. 
but it's an entire sphere. So imagine this, it's like if you had your switches in your house, where just a sphere, and wherever you point it, you have a little point in the sphere, the light is dimmed, right? So if you put it on the very top, the light is on. If you put it on the very bottom, the light is off. And everything in the equator is 50-50 and everything in that great circle is the same, the same amount. Um, so you can also think of it as like any direction you can point, right? Because any direction I can point is, is that point in the sphere. So that's, that's how many qubits there are. And so wherever you are in the sphere, you are a valid, completely valid qubit. So they can be seen like this, right? They can be seen uh, like, you know, the, the North Pole is all up, no down. The, the, the South Pole is all down, no up. And now this is some, the notation we're going to use. Uh, 50, half, half is, is on one side and half minus one half is on the other side. We'll get used to this notation in a minute. It might be a little strange, but, but bear with me. And for the math to work out, actually you want square roots. So it's, it's really... Uh, a pair of numbers whose square add to one. Uh, but I put the squaring root in green so that if you want to forget about it, just put on your green glasses and not think about it. And if you need to do math, just take them off and do math with the square roots. But in reality, I like to think of it as just, just uh, some percentages. Now I have a quiz. Um, if this was the case where, where one side is root five, root five, and the other side is root five minus root five, what do you think this point here is? Who can help me out? What's what's this point closer to us in the sphere? Any ideas? I have two numbers whose squares are one at add, add to one. Almost, I say, see there's some answers. Michael says 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, almost, because 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is the one at the right. Very, very close. Um, since one is the root of five, uh, I see some other answers. Symmetry, two, square root five. So they have to add to one. So it's, um, you have to kind of go imaginary, right? Complex numbers. How many people know complex numbers? So this, this is... Um, root five and, and i root five okay so the, the the way we do it is the top number is always positive and the bottom number can be positive negative or imaginary and um the, there's some math reason for that that we're all allowed to in reality it's it's going to be two complex numbers that can be anything but we can simplify it enough so that the top number is always a positive number and that makes uh that's called the face um but it doesn't really matter so here's, here's, some, here's how it is, right? Let's say you have a number that is square root of, seven, of 0.75 up and square root of 0.75 down. You can express it as a root, root of 0.75 times uh, the qubit zero plus root of 0.25 times the qubit one. And that's the wave function. So whenever I, I tell you about a wave function, I'm talking about some, some percentage, some, some how, how much percentage you're up and how much percentage you're down. Um, and in general, yeah, as I said, it's two complex numbers whose, whose uh, norms add to one, whose, norm, whose squares of norms add to one. The first one is real and the second one non-negative and the second one is uh, complex. So um, just for the sake of this talk, just to, to line up my notation, uh, the North Pole is this one. These are all ways to look at the North Pole. The arrow up, the one that's... Uh, one times the up plus zero times down, and that's the wave function. This is a point in the equator. These are all the ways I can I can point. Not, notice that in the middle I have a vector, right? A vector of, of two numbers, root 0.5 and, and root 0.5. And at the right, I have the wave, the wave function. For a number, for a qubit like this, uh, I have these notations. And for the total south pole, I have this. So I'll be using some of these different notations throughout the talk, depending on which one is uh, more convenient at the time. Um, there are some special qubits. So as I said, the North Pole is this one, the South Pole. And the two ones that are in sort of perfect superposition, root five, root five, we're gonna call the plus, and root five minus root five, we're gonna call them minus. So these are special special qubits. Um, but now here's, here's something slightly interesting. We went from bit to qubit, and obviously we, 
gain some information because the, the bit is too simple and the qubit is more complex than the than the bit. But how much information can we store on a qubit? Well, on a bit we can we can carry a one or a zero. But on a qubit, I can I can carry any number, right? Like I can put it, I can put it on the right height so that I can transfer, I can, I can store the number square root of 0 0.7685, blah, 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 blah. And so in one qubit, I can store any real number between zero and one. And that sounds like cheating, right? Because if in a real number, I can I can store the entire information of Wikipedia if it's, it's infinitely long. So what's what's the catch? I mean, can I store all the information of humanity in one qubit? So I only need a one qubit computer to store all the information? Obviously no, but where's the catch? And the catch is in measurement. So when you measure a qubit, everything goes to hell. So almost. So here's, here's what happens. I have my qubit and the point is, let's say towards the top, right? I had a question. Um, just a question. Um, yes. So in a classical computer, you're measuring either the presence or absence of a voltage. Um, can you explain what are you measuring here in a quantum computing? What is it? Yeah, that's a good question. The hardware values, but what are we measuring? Yeah, there. That's a great question. Yeah, you can make a, a classical computer with voltage, right? Um, but basically anything that's discrete. I mean, I can make one with. Uh, you know, anything that's that's on or off. Uh, quantum computer, there are also different hardwares, and I, I won't talk very much about the hardwares, um, but there's uh, Ion Trap, there's uh, a few different ones, but in, in, in imagine that you have like a quantum particle, like an, a photon or electron or something, and you're able to to sort of raise the energy, shine some light to it to raise the energy from like its, its basic state to its an excited state, and you can go anywhere in between. So these are the, the qubits can be represented by 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 sort of quantum particles, and you can operate on them. It's very hard. That's why these need to quantum computers need to be in uh, cool down to almost uh, a zero Kelvin temperature. Um, so yeah, there are there are several different different hardwares, but in general, it's hard. And that's why there's not that many. That's why quantum computers don't have that many qubits right now. There's only sort of relatively small ones. So they they can measure something like the um, the, the spin or something like that. Um, so that 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 does that can that have two values or can it have only one value when you measure it? Sorry, say say that again, please. So for instance, you're measuring the spin of an atom or a photon. Yeah, that's what I'm measuring. Yeah. Uh, when you get to the point of the measurement, uh, how many values can that have? Yeah, uh, that's where I'm going. Two values. But that's the next thing I'm saying. Yeah. So you're measuring. You you have a you have an atom, and you're gonna measure the spin, and that can go to two things. So the way I look at it is, let's say you have this qubit, and it's somewhere in a superposition of up and down, right? Spin up and spin down. And when you look at it, two things can happen. Uh, let's say that this is uh, seventy percent up and thirty percent down. So two things can happen when you look at it. Uh, one is that it goes up and two is that it goes down. And what happens is that it flips a coin in its head and with 70% probability it goes up and 30% probability it goes down. So the higher it is, the more likely it'll end up high, it up, but it could be up or down. And the moment that happens, all the information of the qubit is completely lost. I'm, I'm swiping some things under the rug here. You could, this. I'm measuring a certain basis. You can measure on different bases and get different things, but in reality, you get you get two things. And, and if, if anybody enjoys physics, if I, if I have an observable, it's a, it's a matrix. And what I end up getting is the eigenvectors of the matrix and the, and, and the uh, energy, the eigenvalue. But uh, I like to see them. We can always sort of simplify everything in such a way that you either get a one, uh, a zero, or a one when you measure. And then you lose all the information of the qubit. So that's the catch, right? I cannot store the entire Wikipedia on a qubit. I can, but if I, the moment I look at it, it either gives me a one or it gives me a zero. So, for, so this is, this is uh, we're going to use some uh, quantum circuits. And a quantum circuit, this is a very simple one. It looks like this. It's like a wiring diagram from left to right. And the qubit sort of goes over here. And when you measure it, I like to imagine that there's 
a red magnet and a blue magnet and, and one of them wins and the higher you are, the, the more likely that the red will win and the lower you are, the more likely that blue will win. And then you come out like that. So that's a quantum circuit and we're gonna have more complicated quantum circuits in, in a few minutes. Um, but I can, I can run this many times and you can see that if I run this quantum circuit many times, I'm gonna get different answers. Sometimes I'm gonna get up and sometimes I'm gonna get down. And I'm gonna get 70% of the time roughly up and 30% of the time roughly down because the qubit that I began with is 70% up and 30% down. So that's flipping a coin, basically. Let's say the hello world of, of quantum programs is, 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 is flipping a biased or a, a, a fair or a, or a biased coin, right? Um, I'm gonna go with quantum gates, but I wanna to stop to see if there are any, any questions. And actually, I'm going to answer one from Americo. It says, comparing classical are dichotomic and quantum are continuous within given limits. And that is correct. Yes, classical are dichotomic because they're on and off. And quantum is a continuous between zero and one in, in many ways. Any other questions? Yes, actually. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Um, I have a about kind of electricity usage. What's the relative usage of a quantum circuit relative to like a computer circuit? I know it's becoming an issue in the machine learning realm. What's the relative usage? I uh, I don't speak hardware very much, so I may not, uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. What do you mean relative usage? So if I was to solve a machine learning problem with both a quantum computer and a regular computer, would one use more electricity than the other? Oh, the quantum computer would use more resources for sure. They're very, yeah, as I said, you have to cool this down to, um, to a very low temperatures. So they, they use a lot more resources. Um, they're getting better. And I think one day they'll be able to to get uh, be, be sort of usable, but right now there's just a few a few quantum computers in the world, and they they use a lot of resources. Thank you. I, I would st still stick to classical <laughs> for for some time. And also, like you never really run something fully on a quantum computer. Like even even when quantum computers are are, are fully operational, uh, we're not going to run everything on them because there's some things that the classical computers do very well, right? Like storing data manipulating data, anything that has input and output, like sums and products and all these things are, are classical, right? The quantum comes in when you have a bottleneck. So sometimes you have an operation that it takes the classical one millions of years and you can do it in a quantum one and get something better. But quantum computers, even if they have a lot of qubits, all, there's always all ran, some randomness involved and there's always some, some, uh, uh, some unpredictability involved. So many things will, will be classical regardless. And the perfect sort of algorithm will just be most a bunch of classical stuff and one quantum step. Yeah. Another question. Sure. Forgive me because I'm not. I don't know much about quantum physics, but um, you're talking about you know when you observe the qubit that it it collapses the the whatever the function is called. Um, Right, yeah, the wave function. So you, you end up just getting like a binary outcome. Yeah. So what, what's the advantage then of, you know, using qubits in the first place? I mean, how, how can we get like all that information that we encoded before and that uh, the sphere you had and move it forward if, you know, we'll be collapsing it? Maybe that's what you're getting to. Um, I will get to some of that because you have certain things when you can operate with these qubits, you can entangle them. Uh, you, can, you can rotate them, you can do many things. And most of the quantum algorithms, what happens is what you do is you, you, you encode your problem and you somehow encode it in an, in an entanglement of qubits and in a system. And then when you observe, you lose a lot of information, but if you do it in a clever way, you get the answer that you wanted, or you can, you can um, uh, rotate, uh, manipulate them in such a way that the right answer will come out with a higher probability. And then you measure it and you get the right answer with a very high probability. And you may not solve the problem, but you get the right answer with, with a high probability. Uh, so yeah, there, there are ways. And that's why, that's why quantum algorithms are, are complicated because you have to figure out a way to actually get your, the answer you wanted when you observed. So I'll, I'll get to a little bit of that later. So they, they do provide a, a, a lot of value. Uh, even if it's kind of hard to 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 
to get answers due to this collapse. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get to I'll get to the gates, which is how we manipulate qubits. It's very interesting how we can how we can manipulate them where where things start to look uh, to look a little magical. So classical gates, we have the 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 the, the ones that we use in, in classical computers, right? For example, a NOT gate takes a zero, turns into a one, and the one turns into a zero. Uh, the equivalent here is a rotation gate, right? So you can take my qubit and just rotate the sphere. 180 degrees and I go from one to zero and from zero to one. And in the same way that I can rotate a sphere, I have three ways I can rotate a sphere, right? Three, three principal axes. So for each one of them and for any number of angles, I have a gate, right? So here's the one that rotates my sphere, my sphere by theta, uh, by theta radians in the X direction. That's the RX gate. The RY gate rotates it in the Y direction and the RZ gate rotates it in the Z direction. So we have a lot of gates. Um, these are the three principles. And if you like to see them as matrices, these are the matrix. So you multiply the matrix by the vector of your qubit, corresponding to your qubit, and you get the corresponding one. So for example, if my angle is pi, this is my matrix Ry. And if I multiply it by my qubit, the North Pole, I get the South Pole. So I, um, this is, uh, you, you operate in qubits and you're basically doing matrix multiplication. The matrices have to be unitary for the gates. So here's the example. This is what I'm doing. Here's what that R Y is doing. So simulating a coin toss, as, as we said, it's uh, it's easy, right? Because all I do is, um, if I want to do a fair coin, I just uh, rotate it uh, 90 degrees, or pi over two, and then I observe, and I get a completely fair coin because you go up or down with half uh, half probability, right? And if I want to simulate a biased coin toss, for example, 70, 30, what I have to do is find the right angle. So this angle 2R cos of 0 0.7 is the one that rotates it here to be 70% all the way up. And I rotate and I observe and I get my biased coin, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of machine learning, right? Because I, I, I looked for the angle. My angle is my parameter, my parameter I, I search for the right parameter to get what I wanted, which is a, a biased coin, right? Uh, imagine that in a neural network, I would just have a lot of angles, a lot of rotations, a lot of entanglements, and I have to work out to find the right angles to get what I wanted. So that's quantum machine learning. Basically, I have to find the right angles. In the same as a neural network, I have to find the right parameters. In here, I have to find the right angles to get what I wanted. Um, but we still need a little more. We still need entanglement, right? Uh, let me check out the questions. Uh, Ted has a very good question. It says, so we can repeat a quantum computation multiple times to get a better estimate of the value of the qubit, right? Correct. If I were to have the same qubit millions of times and I run that computation, uh, I, will, I will get a much more accurate as, uh, estimate of what the qubit was. Um, and here, for example, yeah, if I, if I don't know how much I rotated the qubit, like you rotate the qubit for me, you don't tell me how much you rotated it, but I can run this experiment mi a million times and I get roughly 70, 30, then I say, well, you probably rotated it an angle that put it on, on 70 height. I don't know where in the great circle, right? Because all of them give me 70, 30, but I do know th the probability. So I do, I do, you see, when I, when I measure a lot of times, I don't know what qubit I began with, but I, I do get to find out roughly how high is it on the sphere, right? If it's 50, 50, somewhere in the equator, I have no clue where in the equator, but, but I, I do, I can recover some things in the, in the probability space. So next interesting thing, uh, and, and to me, the most puzzling one of, uh, of that qubits do, it's, it's entanglement. It's, it's uh, kind of crazy how they um, operate with each other. Uh, and uh, the way I like to see it is in a probabilistic setting because I, I like to see everything in probability ways. So imagine that you have, let's say, two people, and there's a probability that each one of them is um, happy or sad, uh, and each one is 50-50. So what are my four probabilities for being for these two people? It, it's uh, both happy, both sad. Uh, one is happy, one is sad, and one is sad, one is happy, right? And if, if they don't know each other and they've never met, they're independent from each other, they're independent events, 
and each one happens with 50% probability, then my probability start 25, 25, 25, 25 for, for the combinations, right? Um, but what if, uh, let's say they were, let's say happily married, right? So when I ask one of them if she's happy, then automatically the other one is, is happy, right? It just never happens that one is happy and one is sad. So all of a sudden my probabilities change. All of a sudden we're not gonna have a happy and a sad. We're gonna have, let's say that, that they're entangled. One of them, let's say 50% of the time they're both happy and 50% of the time they're both sad and they're never happy sad at the same time, okay? So that's what happens when two qubits are entangled. So if I have, for example, a, a qubit, a qubit here and a qubit there, and with 50% probability, each one of them is up or down. If I measure them separately, I get 25% of the time up, up, 25, up, down, and all, of, all the four probabilities. But if I manage to entangle them, I could potentially get something that if I measure, what, if I measure them, they're both up or they're both down with 50% probability and never up and down. So it's almost like if I observe this one, this one makes up its mind. Like if it goes up, this one goes up. Even if they're really far away, I could send one to Andromeda and one to like you know, the other end of the galaxy. And if I measure one, the other one bloop, make, makes up his mind immediately, which is weird, right? Because it contradicts it, that information passes some, um, goes faster than the speed of light. So there, there are reasons why this is possible. And there are reasons why, why you're not really violating the, the, the speed of light, the speed of uh, uh, light, but they're, they're very subtle and they're much more uh, physical. But um, basically, okay, so here's an entanglement quiz. Um, oh no, actually, that, there's, I, there's not a quiz because the answers are there, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you had, for example, 60%, one qubit is 60% of the time up and 40% and of the time down, and the other one is 70% of the time up and 30% of the time down, then uh, what's the probability that they're both up if they've never met, if they're, if they're, not, uh, if they're not entangled? then it's, uh, it's uh, 60 times 70, so it's 42%, right? Because it's independent events. So here are my, my probabilities for, for, the four, for the four arrangements of, of, of up and down. So these qubits are not entangled because they're, they're independent. But if I were to have, for example, this table, that 50% of the time they're both up, 1% of the time they're up down, 16% of the time they're up and down, and 33% of the time they're down, down, then those are entangled for sure because there's no way I can I can put numbers in the rows and columns such that the product is uh, of, of the first two is fifty and and so on right you see, you see what I mean like ask, ask me if it's not if it's not clear but the way to tell is if the product of these two is the product of these two and the product of these two is the product of these two then uh, if, if they are equal they're not entangled because they're independent events and if they're not equal then they my two qubits are definitely entangled. So one is messing with the other one, even if it's by a small amount. Even if I measure one qubit and it changes the wave function of the other one, then for sure they're entangled. If, if it doesn't change it, then, then they're not entangled. So it's, it's kind of subtle, but, but that's, that's how it is. Feel free to stop me if, if, something, is not, if something is not clear. Um, so now we come to something called the tensor product, and this is the tensor product, right? We, we have a question. Question. question, yes. So in neural networks, I know that uh, the parameters are calculated by minimizing a loss function. So uh, by what, sorry? The parameters are calculated in neural network by? Uh, by optimizing a loss function? Yes. So how are the angles calculated? So is there a yes. loss function? Yes, I will get to that. Yeah, you're still optimizing a loss function. Um, in this case, we'll be, well, um, Depends on what you want, but it's, it's very similar. In the case that I will show you, the function is scale divergence, but you can come up with any loss function, log loss or something like that, and then optimize that. So yeah, it's exactly what, what you're thinking. You, you, you build in your quantum neural network, you build in a loss function to what you want and you, and you optimize it. It's, it's very much, um, it, it's, the, the loss function is based on what, on, on what you want to solve, but it's, it's sometimes many times the same as the one in classical. Okay. Um, I also see another question uh, from Jose. It says, can we extend qubit to higher dimensions? In this case, we can use a sphere or in dimensional space. Can we do four, five, six, and dimensions for the combinations? Absolutely. And there's something called qubits, which is not a two vector of two things, but a vector of like as d things. 
And I've never done any quantum computing with those, but I've seen that people use them. Uh, and it's just basically, yeah, you don't have to write two matrices, but like D by D uh, and you're using with like different spins, like instead of having spin up and spin down, you have like spin, like a different uh, hierarchy of spins. Um, as I said, I don't know much about it, but, I, but they, it, it is used. So here's the tensor product, right? If I have, for example, qubit one, that is 0 0.7, 0 0.3 and qubit two, that is 0 0.6, 0 0.4, I can just express it in a very simple way as what's the probability of up, 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 down, up, down, up, and down, down. And that's my new wave function. So I can have a wave function. If I have a wave function of two qubits, it's probability of up, probability of down. If I have a wave function of, of two qubits, it's the four probabilities. If I have a wave function of 10 qubits, I have 10, 20, uh, 1024 things, right? Like what's the probability of all up, all up and one down, and so on, right? So this is important. It's important that I can express things as a tensor product because if things are entangled, um, then if, uh, if, if two qubits are not entangled, I can express them as a tensor product. But if they are entangled, there's no way I can do this, right? There's no way I can express this as a, as a tensor product of two qubits because the numbers just don't add up. There's no way I can get two qubits that those are the probabilities because they are entangled. So when I have two qubits entangled, I'm forced to write the entire wave function. Whereas if they are not entangled, I can break it down into the, the wave function of this first one and of the second one. And this generalizes to more qubits, right? Um, okay, so I've talked enough about entangled and non-entangled. Uh, entangling qubits is a, in hardware, it's, 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 it's complicated. Uh, I don't really know how they do it. There's ways, but uh, there, are, there are something called entangling gates. And they're supposed to mimic what, what um, regular gates do, right? So in a, in a classical computer, I have gates and, or, you know them, so they're, they're here. Um, obviously, and says if you're one if, uh, if, if, if both of them are one. The or says you are uh, one if either one of them is, is one, the output. And in, in quantum, there's a peculiarity, which is that you always keep the same number of qubits. If I started with here, if I classical, if I start with two qubits and I end up with one, but everything in quantum has to be reversible. So if you have a gate that two qubits come in, two qubits have to come out, not one, not three. Um, so this is a C naught gate. Who can help me figure out what the C naught gate does? What's exactly doing there? Anyone can help me. Feel free to take a guess if it's uh, wrong. I won't judge you. We do have, we do have somebody who has an answer. Oh yeah, if you want to speak up. Uh, is it like it's an object depending on the first? Uh, exactly. Yeah, you got it. Depending on the first one, I think somebody on the chat also also said Ted. Uh, the the top one. If, if the top one is up, do nothing with the second one. And if the top one is down, flip the second one, okay? It's almost like a, a, a not gate, but it, it's like, it's almost like the top one turns on the switch for the second one to be a not, a not gate. And so for example, if this is my tensor product, my wave, my wave function, then it just flips the last two, right? So that's the C not gate. So very, is the simplest entangling gate that there is. And it's almost like a very fundamental one. So for example, it, this is the matrix, right? This is the matrix corresponding to that. Um, if I take my, uh, now it's a four by four matrix because it's for two qubits. And what it does is it just flips, it just flips the last two, okay? So everything's at two to the something by two to the something matrix. And so we have this special states called the bell states. The bell states are the two, in, the two most entangled states. One is where half of the time you get up, up, half the time you get down, down. And the other one is where half the time you get up down and half the time you get down up. This is as entangled as a state can be. And I'm just gonna remove the zeros for, for simplicity and I'm gonna uh, show them like this. So this is how I'm gonna represent a wave function from, for the future. Everything that you don't, any, anything that you don't see is a zero, but in general, I should have two to the number of qubits rows in my vector. So how to entangle qubits? So in the, I, I don't know if I shared the repo with you, but I'll, I'll share it afterwards. And there's a, there's a code for, uh, for how to flip a coin, uh, how to do the first, uh, um, the first um, circuit that I showed you. And there's also code for the second circuit that I sum, how to entangle two qubits, right? So 
this is an exercise that is fun to do. Um, if, if all you have at your disposal is a C naught gate, an RX, an RY, an RZ, and an observation, how do you put them together to entangle two qubits? So you start with, with a zero, with, with, with two qubits in the opposition, and then do stuff so that you end up with half the time up, up, and half the time down, down, right? So here, here is the answer, basically. You start with these, and you want to end with this. So here's a circuit that does it, right? Basically, I want, I want that if when I measure, I get half of the time a zero, zero, and half the time a one, one, and I never get them one, one, zero, and zero, one. So here's the circuit that does it. It's an RY of, um, I think, I don't remember the, the amount, uh, the degree. I think it's pi over two. So check it out. This is my circuit. I start with two zeros, right? Uh, I, do, I do a rotation of pi over two degrees on the first one. And now I have these two qubits. And these are their wave functions, right? Half, half, and one, zero. And the tensor product of those two is this. Right, and now I apply a C naught that wrote that flips the third and the fourth. This is kind of an entangling. I don't have a better way to express entanglement than by just joining them, but bear with me. And this one does this; it flips those two, and boom, I have my entangled state. So um, it gets a little more. It it it. This this is like we figured out the 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 angle, right? We figured out the. This circuit, but as you can imagine, things get harder and harder. If I want to entangle four qubits, I need a circuit of hell, right? Like, so that's what machine learning is going to help us to start finding the right angles for the circuit to get the to get the the qubit that the, the the wave function that we wanted to begin with, right? Um, so that's the one we that's the one we get. Uh, feel free to stop me those questions because I, I, I this is where things may get a little meta. Um, there's a, a, a shortcut that we use, which is when I do a C naught and an RY and a C naught, um, I call it a YY. So it's almost like a rotation entangling gate. If I, if I put a big angle, it entangles everything. If I put a small angle, it doesn't entangle them. And it's almost the, the, the entangling equivalent of Y. I'm not gonna talk much about it, but just know that there's, an, there's a, 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 a gate that entangles things based on an angle. The more angle, the more it entangles it. Um, so for example, if the angle is pi over two, then this actually entangles them as well, okay? Uh, the matrix form of this one is this. It's cos uh, theta over two, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, if you wanna take a look at this closer, feel free, but right now I'm just gonna skim through it. Um, so yeah, this is the example of entangling them with using a YY gate. So now we're finally getting to machine learning. By the way, I... I uh, let me know if I'm uh, how I'm doing with time. I think I'll uh, I have ten minutes, but we we built all the stuff we need to get to machine learning. So I uh, we can do this. Uh, this is the QCBM architecture. It's a quantum circuit born machine. So what I want is the following. I'm going to give you an example, right? I'm going to have four qubits. So how many things can I do with four qubits? Sixteen, right? I have sixteen possible states, and let's just say that I have some wave function. So it's just a bunch of numbers that will add to one. Uh, whose squares add to one, right? Um, to save space, of course, I'm going to write them like like only the ones that are non-zero. And uh, let's say that remember the first example, it was creating a fair coin that was very easy, right? Uh, flipping a fair coin. The second example of entangling a state, uh, creating the bell state, was a little harder. We have to do a y a y theta gate plus a plus a c naught. Um, entangling three qubits is pretty hard. I, I, it's a complicated circuit. Entangling four qubits is a more complicated circuit, and in general, it's very complicated. So we're going to use machine learning to figure out how to entangle uh, four qubits. Okay, and uh, here's here's the idea. Um, as I said before, if you have uh, one, this is where the machine learning comes in, right? If I have some angle theta, and I end up with am some some numbers a m b some qubit, and I want it to be this, all I have to do is play with this angle, right? find the right angle that gives me what I want. If I have two, I have a YY gate. And let's say that I start with a one and I want to end up with this state, then I can play with this angle, right? Using machine learning, I can do some kind of, I can play with it until I get what I want. Um, if I were to have three qubits, for example, an example of an architecture is I do a YY gate on the top first two, a YY gate on the first and the third, a YY gate on the second and the third, 
Now I have three angles to play with. And if I manage to play with these three angles correctly to give me the state that I want, then I win, right? So now I have three parameters. So I can, I can start using machine learning with these three parameters in order to cook up some error function, minimize it, and, and get what I want. So this is what we're getting. And if I have four qubits, then I can do several things. So this is how a quantum neural network looks like. It's, uh, you can use several different, I call them topologies. It could be architectures. Um, I can have, for example, in the same way that you have a neural network with a set architecture and you find the parameters, here you have set architectures. You have YY gates between the first and second and first and third. I can add some, some uh, single gates as well. And then I, I play with the angles to find them. So these are the most common topologies that we use for, uh, for these quantum neural networks, for these QCDMs. And if you want the paper, the paper is here. I can, I can give the organizers a link if they want to take a look at uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, Alejandro Perdomo and other, and other people um, that, that came up with this, with this uh, type of neural network. Um, so here's an example of, of one with the line topology. So you have your four qubits. You apply some rotation gates, some single rotation gates. You apply some single uh, Z rotation gates, which is like this. And then you start applying entangling between the first and the second, an entangling between the first and the third, and then an entangling between the first and the fourth. And then you observe. And then let's say when you observe, you get up, down, down, up. So you record that. So that's one application of the neural network. OK. And then, as Ted suggested a while ago, we can we can rerun this computation many, 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 many times. So I run it once and I get up, down, down, up. I'm going to run it a millions and millions of times. And if I want to get, for example, this wave function, then ideally I would get sort of this histogram of probabilities or 16 probabilities, right? And all I have to do now is what I really wanted is, you know, I, I, I measure each one that I get. I, I measure it again and I get something different. I, I, I record it and eventually I get a full histogram. And what I want to do is I pick the right angles so that I get the histogram that I wanted to begin with. And so if, for example, if I want the entangled state, which is half of the time up, 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 and half of the time down, 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 that's the histogram that I want, right? So all I have to do is, is um, a training process where it's called DDQCL, Data Driven Quantum Circuit Learning. And so I run my circuit many, many times. I look at the histogram that I get. I compare it with the one that I wanted using some error function. I'm answering your question. I don't remember the name, but I'm answering your question about the error function, right? I compare them with an error function. And then I go back to the circuit and I update the angles using that comparison, using that error function to be grading the sense, right? Um, and so I'm going to tell you two things now in the last five minutes. One is, what did I mean by compare? Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, I, I compare them, I update the angles, and that's one epoch. I get something slightly better. Then I do several epochs until I get something close to what I want, OK? Just like machine learning. Error function, update step, try again, million epochs, done. Um, OK, so here is. Uh, so here's another way to see another way to see DDQCL. I started with some with some angles theta, and I end up with some angles phi with the distribution that I want, right? So I'm, my my result is the distribution. Um, since I have the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this a little bit. But there is this coding demo here that um, I will I will put the link. Actually, somebody so kind to help me write this link on the on the chat. I, I don't see, oh no, I have it. Tutorial OBSC QML. Take a look, it's got everything. It's got the flipping, it's got the preparing quantum circuits and it's got the QCBM. Um, I'm gonna skip this, but it, it uses in the, in the bar subscribe data set, which is, um, which is a data set where you have either a bunch of bars or a bunch of stripes. You can have the entire thing as well. And you encode each one of them as 
read them as like zeros are one color and ones are another color and you read them as a, as a, uh, as a string. So for example, um, here is the entire data set and I'm going to only look at the ones that are bars and stripes. So I want to generate this distribution. The one that one sixth of the time gives me zero, 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 one sixth of the time it gives me zero, one, zero, one, et cetera. So this is the distribution, right? I want to generate this distribution. Now I'm not going to generate the bell state, but I want to generate this distribution. That's the one in the, in the, in the, in the lab. And so that's this one, right? One sixth of the time it gives me any of the bars and stripes and, and zero all the other time. And uh, so the QCBM basically goes from, from where it started to, to the one we ended. Uh, and I think I have too much mumbo jumbo because I want to get to the, I want to get to KL divergence, which is the, the loss function, right? So the loss function is KL divergence. If I want to compare, if I want to compare these two distributions, what I'm going to do is, uh, if anybody has seen KL divergence, it's a way to compare two distributions and it gives you a big number if they're di different and a small number if they're, if they're very, very much the same. You can use KL divergence, log likelihood, min maximum mean discrepancy, any of those. So I'm gonna show you KL divergence. KL divergence says, uh, it's a formula that if you plug in two distributions that are the same, you get a small number. If you plug in two distributions that are very different, you get a large number. Uh, and the formula is simply this summation of PX logarithm of PX over QX. Uh, if you do that with PX and QX similar, you get small. If you do it with very different P and Q, you get something large. Uh, and if you have something continuous, you can put the integral, but it is all discrete. So I use the summation. And the last thing I'm gonna tell you is how to minimize a function. So if I can compare with KL divergence, now all I need is a process like, uh, like uh, back propagation to update my angles and be able to minimize my function. So there are, you can use gradient descent. You can calculate the derivatives. They're cosines and sines. You can calculate derivatives of sines and cosines. So you can, you can definitely use gradient-based methods, uh, like what you would use to uh, gradient descent. But I like more actually some very very popular methods are non-gradient methods, so gradient-free methods, which are basically a very clever way to to play with the distribution and 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 try to minimize the function uh, with a bunch of uh, points. So there's two that I that I particularly like. There's this one called, um, it, they basically use a lot of, let's say you want to find the minimum value of a function and you have a bunch of friends and all these friends sort of talk to each other and are able to find the minimum of the function or at least a pretty good point. So let me show you particle swarm optimization. Particle swarm optimization works in the following way. Let's say that this is the function that you want to minimize and the, and the dark in the middle is the minimum and the light is the, uh, the maximum. So you want to get to this point. And so I'm going to use a bunch of, a bunch of particles. These are all friends and they're going to try to find the minimum together. So here's, I'm going to tell you three strategies that are very bad, but the combination is good. So the first strategy is inertia. Okay. If these points are walking around, then let's say they're all walking in some direction. Oh, and, and the second strategy is called personal best. And the third one is called team best, but the, the good one is the combination of all. So inertia works like this. If you're walking in a certain direction, continue walking in that direction forever and uh, see where's the minimum point that each, that each person find. And the minimum of those is the one that results. So let's say it's this one. So it's not too good. Personal best, what you do is each particle walks around recording how well it does. And the personal best for each particle is the minimum that it has arrived so far. So for example, let's say that for this first particle, the personal best is one. And for the second particle, the personal best is two and so on. And the strategy says, walk towards your personal best and record how low you got. So the lowest was this. So it's not a great strategy either. And the third one is team best. So they talk to each other, the points talk to each other. Uh, so far in, in, the, in the walk that everybody has done, there's gotta be one that was the best of all. So let's say it was this one. This is the best they could achieve. So they should all walk in that direction. So that's a bad strategy too, because it, it got us here, right? Stop me if this is not clear, by the way. Um, but the best strategy is all. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take many steps and every step is gonna be the same. Each point is going to look 
at inertia. It's going to see the direction in which it was walking. Then it's going to look the direction towards its, its personal best, the best it's achieved so far. And then in the direction to the team best. OK? And it's going to take a walk in the direction of the sum of these three vectors. So in, in some way, it's like one, one step on each of the three directions. And then each point does this every time. So you're always walking towards your best, but also towards the group best, and also towards the direction you were going. And this actually works really well. If you do it many times, it leads the points towards the minimum. OK? So that's one non-gradient way to um, to get a minimum of a function. Um, the other one's CMAES, but I will I will skip it. Oh, where's my mouse? One second, sorry. Um, I will skip CMAES, but feel free to feel free to look it up yourself. Um, and yeah, and I and that's that's pretty much all. I mean, this is a summary of, of what happened. We have a neural network with a bunch of single gates, a bunch of tangling gates. Uh, each one with angles. We put your qubits through, you measure many times, you get a distribution, you compare it with the one you want. Uh, you use some optimizer, either gradient or gradient free. Uh, you measure with an error function, use your gradient optimizer, update the angles until you get the perfect angles. And that is the actual winning angles that you get if you run the notebook that I, that I linked there um, and with a different architecture. And I think I'm way out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and skip some things that weren't that important anyway. Oh, oh yeah. Some, if you want to take a look at a demo, take a look at this one. It's a demo of, of this done in an actual, in a, in a quantum computer and simulator, but you could also put in a quantum computer. Um, take a look at this link, which I will paste in the, in the comments soon. And uh, you get the tutorial that actually I, I made. So it's got a video and it shows you how to do it in, a, in, in orchestra on a quantum computer. And this is what you end up seeing. Actually, if you put your phone in this, uh, in, in this um, code, you'll, you'll get the link. So feel free, to, feel free to take a picture there. And uh, yeah, and I think I'm, I'm done. So if you have any questions, before, you, before we go with questions, I'm going to do some, some uh, shameless self-promotion. Uh, I have a YouTube channel if you want to take a look. It's uh, it's uh, YouTube.com, uh, YouTube uh, Louis Serrano, and I have a bunch of videos on machine learning and some coming up on quantum machine learning. Uh, they're all kind of friendly, cartoonish, and and very few formulas. So if you enjoy learning that way, I recommend it to you. And I also have a book called Rocking Machine Learning, which is coming up pretty soon. Uh, it's available on ebook, so feel free to take a look. And uh, there's the YouTube channel, and there's my Twitter. And there's my page where you can find all the information. So there's uh, a link if you want to take a look. Sorry, I went a little over time, uh, but I, uh, I am done. Thank you very much. I have some questions on the chat that I can start answering if, if you guys like, uh, or if you have any. Uh, we have a couple of questions here in the audience. We also have a question in the chat. I'm going to check the chat. Let me do one on the chat by Mike, Mike, Mike right. C. Yeah, is that OK? Uh, Mike Salem. Hi, Mike. Uh, it's actually my buddy from back in the day. Uh, question says, when are you dealing with these qubits and states, the matrices look like they're sparse. I'm assuming this increases space and time complexity a fair amount. How do you typically handle this issue and how do you utilize any hashing algorithms to condense information? Ooh, uh, good question. Um, well, here's, here's the thing. I mean, the special thing about a quantum computer is that for us, the matrix is two to the n by two to the n. But for the quantum computer, it's n, right? Like and for its quantum computers, n qubits. So that's where the complexity, that's where the quantum computers remove a lot of complexity, right? Like the, for what for us looks two to the n, for the computer looks, looks like n qubits, right? So we, we, if we're gonna do the calculations on the simulation, we do have to worry about all these matrices. But when we're observing, when we're, when we're running the, 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 the circuits and observing, the computer's not thinking about a two to the n by two to the n matrix. It's actually doing things in the, in the order of n. So that's why, why these are wonderful. So we don't need to do, to do all that, right? Uh, another question by Cynthia, will the recording be made available? I believe yes, but I'm gonna let my folks at uh, USF uh, answer that question. And I think that's it 
Oh, um, I think that's it for the um, for the questions in here. So feel free to answer any ask any oh, yeah. questions in the in right. person if you like. Um, hi, Luis. Um, hi. First of all, I want to give you a special thank you because I was actually one of your behind the screen students. We were taught at Udacity. Oh, thank you very much. It's so nice meeting you. Thank you. And that's uh, yeah, that's part of my uh, journey, and here I am. And uh, I have a question that uh, back to the part you're talking about a great sense. And uh, the the new way you're talking about earlier, um, does it I actually also have the problem that uh, like dealing with the uh, global minimum and local minimum and the uh, building Spanish problem? Yeah. If, if the let, let me see if I understood the question. If 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 I still have the same problem of machine learning that that sometimes you might get stuck in a local minimum. Right. Correct. Yeah, that happens well. That happens as well. And there's basically you are we are as helpless to that problem as as we are in classical machine learning. We cannot um, fully find the global minimum of these functions, but it's mostly local minima. And we use the same techniques that we would use in machine learning, which is running it several times, or etc. The problem in quantum computers is called barren plateaus. Um, of like uh, when you get um um what's the word um not exploding gradient but the opposite like um anyway when you have a flat a flat uh, space and you can't really walk in the gradient like we have the same problems because we're at the end of the day we're minimizing see the quantum stuff happens inside the circuit but once you measure and you're out you're dealing with numbers right so you have numbers that you're comparing to other numbers classically. The error function happens classically. KL divergence is purely classical. And the steps that you take are purely classical. So the only, it, it, you have the same problems as you would uh, training a neural network because you're minimizing a classical, um, a, a function with classical methods. So you, you, you do end up running into the same things. Yep. Well, thank you. Thanks for answering the question. I'm not sure if I, if I answered it correct. Uh, if I, Yes, yes, you answered the question. Okay. I think that's about all the time we have. So uh, should we have another round of applause to Louise? Thank you. <laughs> You're a very dynamic group with a lot of really good questions and, and overviews, and you also answered my questions very well. So thank you all for, uh, for being here. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you in the audience for, for your attendance. I just want to see Next time I'll do it from uh, from San Francisco, actually. Hopefully.